chapter 5, verse 22. I'm going to read the whole section. Of course, we know that it all flows out of verse 18, be being filled with the Holy Spirit. If you're not filled with the Holy Spirit, you're probably not going to be a Spirit-filled husband, a Spirit-filled wife, a Spirit-filled parent, a Spirit-filled child, or a Spirit-filled Christian in the body of Christ. And so it starts and flows out of there, but verse 22, it says, Wife, submit to your husbands as to the Lord, because the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is the head of the church. He is the Savior of the body. Now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives are to submit to their husbands in some things. Oh wait, I'm sorry, everything. (laughs) Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church. How did Christ love the church? Of course, he died for it and gave himself for her. He gave self-sacrificially. He gave 100%, expecting nothing in return except for our simple love of him. To make her holy and cleansing her with the washing of the water of the word. He did this to present the church to himself in splendor without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but holy and blameless. In the same way, husbands are to love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. For no one ever hates his own flesh, but provides and cares for it just as Christ does for the church. And here's what we're going to look at today. These these are going to be our scriptures that we're going to focus on. Since we already looked at the other in in great detail. Since we are members of his body for this reason. Of course that also says since we are members. Some of your versions will say of his bones and of his flesh. Or of his flesh and of his bones. Okay. Verse 30. And then verse 31 says for this reason a man shall live his father and mother. And be joined to his wife and the two shall become one flesh. This mystery is profound, but I am talking about Christ and the church. To sum it up, each one of you is to love his wife as himself, and the wife is to see that she respects her husband. Friends, the marriage relationship, bar none, is the closest relationship that you will have here on earth. The husband and the wife actually become part of each other and that oneness is so incredible and 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 all through the scriptures as we start in genesis to today it talks of permanency it's not a contract you just can't get out of it anytime you feel like it according to god's word and we're to be in it Now, verse 30, he says he talks about being members of his body. And because of this closeness, this relationship, of course, it is a representation or a illustration of his relationship between Christ and his church, us. And it's so significant, the relationship between the bridegroom, Jesus Christ, and the bride of Christ, us, and him correlating it. To the relationship between the husband and the wife. And that's significant beyond our wildest recollection or dreams because that oneness is supernatural. It's not from man, but it is from God. And that is what we really have to understand because that oneness, we have become one with the Lord, a glorious unity, united in our lives. Matter of fact, remember when Jesus said to his disciples, I am in the Father and he in Jesus, in, in him, and I in you, the church, us. And then remember when Jesus prayed, he says, we may be one even as the Father and the Son are one. And so this, this oneness, this supernatural oneness based around this concept of agape love or self-sacrificial love is the exact representation of Jesus and his church and a husband and his wife and every other relationship is subordinate to that. Every other, other relationship in our life takes second place outside of our relationship, of course, with the Lord. There is no greater relationship on this planet, on this earth, greater than a mother to a child or a child to a father or any other relationship to a sibling or whatever it may be. 
And so in verse 431, I want to focus on that quite a bit this morning. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be cling to or cling to or join to his wife. Now, this is a direct quote out of Genesis chapter 2, verse 24. And it's important that we go back there for a little bit and see kind of what it is. Because like the rest of scriptures, Genesis principles, right? Just like every other scripture that we looked at, it was inspired by the whole godly men, inspired by the Holy Spirit, written by the Holy Spirit, God's word for our lives, right? And so, I mean, it's relevant, it's authoritative to mankind in the beginning, and now and forever, it is what it is. They are unchanging principles. They do not change from when the, the time that God said, in the beginning, all the way to the end of Revelation, where he said, come, Lord Jesus, come. They are unchanging. And when they were written, they were relevant for that day. And when they're written today, they are relevant for this day. And, in, and, and guys, in a sea of constantly changing opinions on sexuality, on gender, on Christian ethics, on, on sexual ethics, it's constantly changing. And everybody's coming along saying, well, did God really say? Right? Right? I mean, it goes back to the tree, right? Satan talking to Eve. Did God really say? Did God really say? And and so all this redefining of, of marriage and family and all this redefining of what God says and God's heart and desire for the marriage relationship and for family is being assaulted. And, and the reason why is because is if Satan can break down the family, if Satan can destroy marriages, then he has won. If he can tell you and get you confused to who you are and how God has created you to be beautiful and precious in his sight as a male or a female, then he is one. And so that he assaults us and he attacks us and he deceives us. But guys, marriage wasn't invented by man. Marriage wasn't a thought on a man's mind. It was a thought in a, in, in, in a, on God's heart and God's mind. And he brings this beautiful thing to happen. And he gives us this wonderful gift of marriage. And it's a huge blessing. And, and I love it because if you look at the scriptures, God didn't choose an animal. God, God, didn't, God didn't make an exact replica of Adam. What God did was his, he looked down and he saw his creation was good. And then all of a sudden he has Adam go and he name all the animals, right? Oh, there's Mr. and Mrs. Elephant, Mr. and Mrs. Orangutan, Mr. and Mrs. Giraffe, Mrs., Mr., Mr. and Mrs. Kudu, Mr. and Mrs. Alligator. And what happens, right? And so he doesn't, Adam looks around and he realizes, man, there's nothing for me. He doesn't go out and he get himself an orangutan or anything else. That's for you single guys. We'll unpack that ne- next week. Although I'm looking at some of your boyfriends right now and I'm wondering. <laughs> but he doesn't go out, and get a mo- go out and get a monkey or an orangutan or anything like that. What happens is God looks, sees that there's an issue, right? And what does God do? He looks down and he says, it's not good that man should be alone. I will make a helper compatible to him. So God sees there's something missing, and he sees that something's lacking. And how many of you are missing your rib right now? God sees that, right? That, that actually it's not rib, it's taken out of the side. And so what does God do? God is so cool, he puts Adam to sleep, right? He doesn't make Adam go look and, and search and, and, and run around and try to find his bride. We'll look at that next week. I'm getting into next week's sermon, sorry. But he puts him to sleep. And, and, and woman isn't taken from his feet, not taken from his head, but taken from his side. And, and, and the cool thing is, it, it's two words there that, that are used in the Hebrew. It's ish and isha. It's only a, 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 a tiny thing. Ish is man and isha is woman. So, that, so it's gender specific. There's no confusion. 
And he, and he, and he takes it, the, 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 the side out of Adam. And, and the cool thing about that is, is it's the bone marrow is where your blood is created from. And the cool thing is, is he just changes one little thing. He puts a little Y chromosome in there. So Ish and Isha, man and woman, man and wife is actually what it says. Come together out of his side to be compatible, to be a helpmate, to be a friend, to be a lover, to be a best friend in the whole wide world, to become one with intimacy and companionship and co-workmanship and, and procreation and, 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 and it's an exact clone of himself and guys in Leviticus it says the life is in the blood and so he's taken out of the bone marrow and given life into this into, into Eve in the same way that the church is birthed right out of the side of Jesus he was pierced and what happened the church was born the life is in the blood. If you have the blood of Christ applied to your life, then what happens is, is now you have everlasting life. You are born again. And the, and the, and the symbolic representation in the scriptures is phenomenal. If you really dig and look and your eyes are open to God's word and how he wants to just blow your mind with it. <laughs> God is so cool. And so he looks down and he, and he sees the, 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 there's, um, he makes a clone of himself. The only thing missing is the, he, puts a y, he throws the Y chromosome around and, and changes everything. And in verse 22 of Genesis chapter 2, it says, The rib that the Lord God had taken from man, he made into a woman and brought her to man. And he said, Whoa, man! And so he, that's how the name came about. <laughs> she is hot! <laughs> Or what's that one? Uh, that one? I forget that movie. Smoking. <laughs> and so here she is, and, and, it's a, and it's complete and a companion and a helpmate. Not molded from the ground as a animals and Adam were, were, but taken from his side. And Adam was incomplete and lacked everything. And, 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 and what did God do? He brought this beautiful woman to him. She was made for him and, and, and became one with him. And that Hebrew word there, comparable, or fit for, in Genesis 2.18 indicates a oneness and an in, in, intimacy that is so supernatural and so amazing. And then God blesses them. And what does God say when he blesses them? He says, go be fruitful and multiply. And gave them children. And when those children are born, we look at those beautiful children, and as the two become one flesh in intimacy, they hold this little miracle in their hands. It's the half woman and the half of the man and the DNA and all that kind of cool stuff comes together in this little child. And I don't know about you, but the first time you hold that little child in your arm, it is absolutely phenomenal. And God says, here, I have blessed you. I've blessed you, husband and wife. I've blessed you in friendship and intimacy and, and procreation and all these wonderful things. And it is a beautiful gift. But it reeks of permanency. And Jesus affirms the divine created order in Matthew 19. At the beginning of creation, he says this, Haven't you read, he, re he replied, that he who created them in the beginning made them male and female? Period, the end. Summed up. And so if you argue with that, you're arguing with God. If you argue with that, you're arguing with Jesus. Jesus is God. And he's just quoting out of Genesis here, and he goes on to say, and he said, for this reason a man will leave his father and his mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let no one separate and he continues and tells us who should be in this marital union in mark chapter 10 verse 6 he says but from the beginning of creation god 
made them male and female. And so here Jesus is quoting out of the first book of Genesis and, and, and letting everybody know that this happened at the beginning of creation on the sixth day of creation. And he gives us this gift. And guys, the marriage relationship should take precedence over everything else that you have going on in your wife. Look what he says there in chapter uh, 5, verse 31. It says, for this reason, for this reason, I've made this relationship the most important relationship in your life that should be sacred and should be divine. It's a holy ordinance. I created it. I wanted, I wanted to get, it's a gift from God. I created it for you to enjoy with mutual satisfaction and delight. And I created it with permanency. And he's joined to his wife in this union that's nearer and more intimate than any other relation. Matter of fact, that word there, that he, the Hebrew word bond or join together, it means to cling, stick, stay close, cleave, keep close, stick to, follow closely, join to, catch, overtake, or be joined together in the Hebrew. That's in Genesis. In the Greek word, proskaleo, means to, to glue upon, to glue to, to join oneself closely or to stick to. I think that's kind of interesting, right? How can you become closer than that, right? Glued to something, right? And I don't know, maybe, maybe some of you are welders. I know I can weld a little bit. And what happens is you got two pieces of metal, you got a broken piece of metal, and you weld it, right? What happens? The weld then becomes stronger than the two pieces of metal that were put together. So when you weld that, right? It sticks closer. Now, what happens if you break that? Usually, the weld is strong. If you do it right, the weld is stronger than anything else. It takes another piece of the material with it. And if you were to go and you were to rip your wedding picture in half and then glue it back together and rip it again, it would rip most likely if you use the right kind of glue in a different spot. And and, and what that gluing is, that word proskaleo means, it was actually a medical term where you take a a slice in your leg and you stitch that slice together. It, It means to mend or to unify a wound together. And whether they tape it or 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 you rope it or whatever, what happens is is it comes together, right? It sticks together. And I don't know about you, but how many of you have ever ripped a good wound that has been stitched together open again? It's painful, right? It was meant when you sewed it together to stay permanently together. It wasn't meant to be ripped. And if you know anything about those medical terms, if you get after it's together for a period of time, what happens? It becomes, the scar becomes stronger than the flesh on, the, on the either side, just like when you break a bone. The, break, the breaking of the bone where the bone mends together becomes actually stronger than the bone around it. And so it was a medical term, uniting of wounds. And I, I mean, talk about painful when that, that gets ripped apart, right? Or if, you, if you're, maybe you're a cabinet maker in construction and you glue p- two pieces of wood together, right? Usually if you do it right and you break that apart, what happens is a piece of that will co- go with the other piece of wood. And so what God is saying here and and what the Holy Spirit is saying here when when this word is used is that there is a sense that if you break that bond, what is going to happen is it's going to damage something. And so the Holy Spirit is speaking of this permanency, this coming together. And it, just like a marriage, if you break, a piece of it goes with you. And we all know that it's painful, heart-wrenching. No matter the circumstance of your marriage, it is meant for permanency. And I don't care if you got drunk and got married in Vegas. Once you make that decision, it's forever. Because I've had people say that. I had a buddy 
say, well, I can leave her because I was so drunk and I got married to her in Vegas. No, you can't. It's done. It's finished. (laughs) Unless somebody cheats on you or an unbelieving spouse leaves, right? It is meant to be permanent forever. I love what R. Ken Hughes says. He said, there is an amazing unity in marriage. The sexual union entails mysterious and sacred depths that men and women become one flesh suggests an exchange of soul, a oneness of soul, and indicates something of a physiological depth of the marital union. Marriage ideally produces two people who are as much the same person as two people can be. Christians in marriage have the same Lord, the same family, the same children, the same future, and the same destiny. But when we break that union, that can be the most painful experience, and I know a lot of you have dealt with that. And I want to be perfectly clear, God does not hate the divorcee, He hates divorce, okay? There's grace, there's mercy, there's forgiveness when that happens in a family, in a marriage. We're going to unpack that in just a second here, but what I know is, is we often notice the pain of this happening. It's just so slow and it's so gradual, right? It happens, it creeps in, you know, and it's over a period of time, right? The bitterness creeps in, the unforgiveness creeps in, the, 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 the anger creeps in, the, 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 the violation of trust creeps in, and then finally the adultery creeps in or whatever, or whatever it may be, and it just, it's just it's like this slow death. It's like the frog in the kettle, if you will, or the poison in the crock pot that's cooking slowly, and you don't really realize that it's in there. Like if you put a frog in in a boiling kettle and you turn the boiling kettle on, he will never know it gets hot. He will not leave. He will boil to death, right? And that's kind of like how it happens. It's like this slow, grinding, painful, and, and what happens is, is your heart becomes to get hard, and you don't even notice it creeping in upon you. And before you know it, all you want is out. You, you, you don't care anymore. You just want out of this thing. You don't even care about the consequences anymore because it has been so long and so trying and so painful and so hurting and so broken that, man, you just want out of this thing. Your heart begins to grow hard and, and we become numb to God and numb to His covenant and numb to marriage and we want out. We did, everything is just crazy. And sometimes it can only be happening in one spouse. It's not even happening in the other spouse. The other spouse thinks everything is just going along just great. And that happened to another person that I knew, sad to say. When you counsel for 20 years, you see, about see it all. And what happened was is She had no clue, and there's this other woman, and the other woman was actually my buddy's wife. When I say buddy, he was a member of our church up in Idaho. And what his wife was doing was she was cultivating this relationship online with this guy down in Southern California, and she would go on business trips down to see him. Well, this guy, he had a few kids, and well, he waited, and this is kind of crazy. He waited. They go on this two-week vacation that they'd been planning for a year. They go on this cruise, and then they, they, they have this wonderful time and, uh, on the beach in Florida, and they come back, and as soon as they get back, what does he do? He says, I am leaving you for this other woman, and she was absolutely 100% clueless. I get a hold of her. I, I say, I know the wife that's the marriage wrecker and the family. I mean, it's just a big mess. But she was clueless. She thought she had a happy marriage. And he leaves her for this other woman. Sad to say, in the last 10 years, it seems like there's more walkout women than there are walkout men where it used to be the other way around. But look what God's word said in Malachi. Malachi chapter 2 verse 13 says this. And this is the second thing that you do. You cover the altar of the Lord with tears, with weeping and crying, so he does not regard the offering anymore, nor receive it with goodwill from your hands. Yet you say, for what reason? Because the Lord has been witness between you and the wife of your youth, with whom you have dealt treacherously. 
Yet she is your companion and wife by covenant. Not contract. But did he not make them one, having a remnant of the Spirit? And why one? He seeks godly offspring. Therefore take heed to your spirit and let let none deal treacherously with the wife of his youth. For the Lord God of Israel says that he hates divorce, for it covers one garment with violence, says the Lord of hosts. Therefore, take heed to your spirit and do not deal treacherously. Look, guys, this is not my words. This is the Lord's words. And my heart is, is if you've been divorced, I don't want to beat you up and I don't want to beat you down. But if you're still married or going through a divorce or thinking about going through a divorce, this is for you. If you've been through a divorce, I want to let you know that the blood of Christ cleanses you from all unrighteousness. There is not a sin that will separate you from his love and his intimacy and his communion and his power and his might and his grace except blasphemy of the Holy Spirit, and that is rejecting Christ till the day you die. Every other sin is covered under the blood. And God does not hate the divorcee. He hates divorce. So I want to make that extremely clear. If you have had a divorce, you have an opportunity to ask God for forgiveness. And I would encourage you to go to your spouse and ask them for forgiveness. Well, Garrett, it wasn't my fault. You know what? I hear that all the time. It's never your fault, right? It's always his fault or her fault. Out of 100 marriages that I've dealt with, 95% of them, 90% of them mostly think it's the other person's fault. So occasionally you have the people that admit that it's their fault. Well, regardless of how you feel, everybody is involved. It takes two to tango, right? And so my encouragement to you so that you can make it right is to go to that person, write them a letter, send them an email or whatever, and say, hey, you know what? Please forgive me. You know, I was young, I was stupid, whatever. I mean, you, you know. I, I, I mean, and then ask God to, to replace that brokenness, that ripping of flesh, that covenant broken. Ask him to redeem that. Ask him to come in and change that, Right? We've all blown it. We've all sinned. I, I, I mean, I, before my feet hit the ground every day, I sin. But if you're divorced, here's what I encourage you to do. Here's what I plead with you to do. Sit down with your children and confess the mistakes that you've made. Whether it's the person that God was telling you not to marry and you married them anyways, or whether the scripture says do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers and you married an unbeliever rejecting the, the scriptures, or you got married before you were a Christian, right? And by, by God's grace, I didn't. Barely. And, and we come, we sit down with our kids and we tell them, hey, you know what? This is what I would do differently. Teach them that they do not need to make the same mistakes that you you made. Let God use it as a ministry in your life. God desires to use it in your life because he is in the the business of blessing failure. And so just like he takes my testimony of rejecting him and hurting people and all my lust and anger and bitterness and pride and greed and everything that was in my life, he uses that now in my ministry to people. He can do the same to you. If you've been divorced, if you've been through the pain of that and the suffering of that, God would use you to encourage other people in their lives to follow hard after Christ. And he will use it in your kids' lives. Where you can sit down with them and you can say, look, look, my failures, I, 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 did, I did things, I made some mistakes, sin got in, I did all the wrong things, I, I didn't love, I didn't forgive, I didn't serve, but son, but daughter, but friend, you don't have to make the same mistake I did. And maybe you guys were married to a monster and you had to get out before he killed you. <laughs> don't get me wrong here, Right? But even that, I'm sure you learn some things in that you can share with other people that are married to the same monster, <laughs> right? And you can love and you can, because guys, God gives us our experience, our pain, our sin, our hurt, our brokenness. I mean, he doesn't give us our sin, but you guys can understand. And he takes that and he turns beauty 
from ashes, burned up desolate places. He can make beautiful and green and flowing with, 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 with springs of living water. And, and he wants to do that in your life so that you can now minister to other people, no matter what it is in your life. But especially with this, because God loves to take broken things and make them better. And guys, your, wa- your wounds, your pains, your scars can be the point of your ministry, just like Jesus' wounds and pains and scar are the point of all of our ministries when we put Jesus Christ in the center of them. Amen? One more thing. One more thing. One of the greatest pains that I see is when people are going through a divorce and they begin to badmouth the other spouse. Or people have been through a divorce and they begin to use that as cannon in their father and their and, uh, as cannon fodder to turn their kids against the other one. Remember guys, their mommy and daddy still to the other kid, you will do more damage in their hearts. You will destroy them. Always bite your tongue and do everything you can possibly do to keep your kids having a good impression of the other spouse. I'm pleading with you. Because you will produce baggage in them because just because your flesh has been ripped apart, don't tear theirs apart. Please, do your best to keep them out of it. Keep them out of it. Parents, in this marriage relationship, let's go back and read it again in verse 31. For, for this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife. And the two will become one flesh. Wow. Okay, so here we got that thing again. And here's, here's something that's very interesting here. And I'm, I'm going to say this stuff, and it's probably going to ruffle some feathers, but, you know, that's kind of what I do. Um, and I don't mean to do it, but it's, it's fact. Okay? It's God's Word. Here's the reality. Okay, if you have a child and they get married to somebody else, stay out of the middle of the relationship. You have released them to that husband, you have released them to that spouse, and now the husband is now the covering of the wife, and the wife is now the partner of the husband. And the worst thing, and I see it all the time, is people get in the middle of their kids' relationships. And that's it says, leave your father and mother and cling, cling to your spouse. They do not need to be in the middle of your relationship. And it, it, it drives me crazy, and I see it, and... Some of these two homeschool kids, and by the way, I'm a homeschool parent, so don't freak out if you're a homeschooler. They're the worst. Homeschoolers are the worst. Why? Because we've been mentoring, we've been discipling, we've been sharing, we've been invested in their lives since day one, and, 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 and so, so we think we have a right because we've raised these kids, and now we've given them over, and we think we can get in the middle of it because we've been their spiritual leader, we've been their mentor, we've been giving advice, we've been discipling them, Right? But guys, I have seen more marriages destroyed and ruined and wrecked and st- by not heeding this principle. Absolutely insane. And, and what happens is, is you begin to hear this stuff from your kid and you become, and I don't care how godly you are, you become to get angry and bitter, right? Oh, why is he she treating my little Johnny like this. Oh, why is he treating my little Susie like this? And, and what happens is, is you get this stuff and you hear it time and time and time again from your, your kid and, 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 your, and, your wife, and your daughter gets in a fight with her, with, with her husband and the first thing she does is call her mommy and mommy has to hear this stuff. And, and what happens is, is they get in the midst of this thing and all of a sudden everything. And then what happens is it begins to produce insecurity and all of a sudden husband's like, who are you talking to? You talking to your sister? You talking to your, you talking to your mom? You talking to your dad? 
Right? I mean, and then all this insecurity comes in and, and, and it just pushes that, that, that oneness even farther and farther and farther and farther apart. And I do know some women, by the way, some very godly women, that very early in the relationship, now I'm not talking about beating your daughter, dude. Somebody beats my daughter, it's on, right? I hope you all bail me out. You know what I'm saying? I'll serve him up like John McEnroe. I'm not talking about that, okay? But I very seldom meet a godly woman that when the daughter calls, that she will go, honey, it's disrespectful and ungodly for you to air your dirty, dirty laundry with me. You need to repent. And second of all, I want to show you 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 1 through 6. It says that a gentle and quiet spirit is very precious in the sight of God. And so they begin to walk them through the scriptures and they say, honey, this is what I want. And how much have you prayed for your husband? Well, I'm so mad at him. I haven't prayed with him for two weeks. Okay, well, we're going to pray. You're going to pray first and you're going to pray for him right now. And make the daughter pray for her husband. And then what happens is, is now it's turned around, right? And honey, you're disrespecting your husband by telling me his dirt and breaking his confidence and his trust. And honey, you need to repent. And the sad thing is, is, is just like me, I never counsel a couple without hearing both sides of the story. The Bible says a fool, a man's a fool unless he hears both sides of the story before he counsels anybody, right? And so I personally will not, count if, if, if a woman comes in my office or a man comes in my office and starts venting dirt on their spouse, I'm like, whoop, time out. Eh. Time out. Let's set up an appointment next week and we'll bring them both in the room. Because I want to hear his side of the story. Or I want to hear her side of the story, or whatever it may be, right? And so, but the problem is, if we don't leave and cleave and cling to our spouse, what happens is, is mommy and daddy get involved in this relationship that is holy and righteous and powerful and supernatural and godly and begin to deteriorate it and, and, and it begins to rot. And guys, I'm, I can't express to, to you enough. I have seen this a hundred times. Look, if you're having problems in your marriage, come to us. Come to a pastor. Go to a counselor. I, got, I, have, I have 10 couples in this church that have been married 20 years plus that would be happy to walk you through this scenarios, right? They would be happy to come alongside of you and disciple you and love you and encourage you and tell you and show you what a God. I mean, you got Larry and Judy sitting out here. I think they've been married 50, how many? 51 years. You think they got something to say? <laughs> right? And so we'll pair you with them. But keep mommy and daddy out of it, guys. I'm pleading with you. And mommy and daddy, stay out of it. Unless... He hits your little girl, and then we'll go together. <laughs> Anybody else want to ride with us? Yeah, that's what I'm talking about, right? <laughs> and then we'll deal with it, right? Now, I'm running out of time, and i got to figure out where I want to go. Last thing I'll say is, and parents, keep your kids out of the marriage as well. Don't make them pick sides. Verse 31, it says one flesh. This is supernatural. As we've looked at, it's, 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 it's so amazing, the thing that God has done between a man and a wife. And this closeness is, and the beauty of it is manifested in our children as we look at our beautiful children that we're raising. And as we love them and we care for them. And they get our genes and our DNA, and they even look like some of us, right? I mean, it's pretty, pretty cool how this happens in a marriage. In verse 32, it says, the mystery is profound, but I am talking about Christ and the church. So this great mystery that he correlates this oneness of us coming together, the sacredness of the church wed to the sacredness of marriage. Your marriage is either an image or a denial of this. 
this beautiful thing, this beautiful picture, brought out of the sight of Christ. Martin Lloyd Jordan says it like this. He says, this is true regard in regard to the pattern of the first man and the first woman. Woman was made at the beginning as the result of an operation which God performed upon man. How does the church become, come into being? As the result of an operation which God performed on the second man, his only begotten son, beloved son on Calvary's hill. A deep sleep fell over Adam. A deep sleep fell upon the son of God. He gave up the ghost. He expired. And there in that operation, the church was taken out. Man, that is just so profound. As the woman was taken out of Adam, so the church is taken out of Christ. The woman was taken out of the side of Adam, and it is from the Lord's bleeding, wounded side, that the church comes. Guys, the body, that that word can be translated out of my flesh and out of my bones, or out of my bones and out of my flesh. Jesus purchased you and I. The blood-bought saints of God purchased by the blood of Christ for a relationship with him and a relationship with one another. Verse 33, and I promise this is the last verse, so I'm closing with this. To sum up, each one of you is to love his wife as himself, and the wife is to respect her husband. This love and respect is so deep, so personal, so supernatural, so powerful. It represents physical intimacy. You're, you're created as a, 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 in, in, a, in a, a, a trichotomy, if you will, body, soul, and spirit. That's how God created you in his likeness and image, body, soul, and spirit. And so your, your, your spirit is supposed to become one as you read together and you pray together and you serve together and you love Jesus together. And your, 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 your soul is supposed to come together. Your mind, your will, your emotions are supposed to come together in this oneness as you, as you raise kids together and as you walk together and as you work together and as you serve together and as you love together. That, that, that soul comes together in, in, a, in a unity. And then finally, physically. Don't let the kiss fade. Don't let the hugs fade. Don't let the cuddling fade. Don't let the sex fade. Cultivate that relationship physically. Cultivate that emotionally, your mind, your will, solically, your emotions. Cultivate that and and, and cultivate it spiritually. Read together, pray together, go to conferences together, serve together, go to church together. Do all those things together. And Satan will not get into your marriage. Paul says it this way in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 3. He says, a husband should fulfill his marital duty to his wife and likewise the wife to her husband. A wife does not have the right over her own body, but the husband does. In the same way, a husband does not have the right over his own body, but the wife does. Verse 5, listen to this. The only way that you can break this is out of a spiritual devotion of some kind. Do not deprive one another except when you agree for a time to devote yourselves to prayer. Then come together again. Otherwise, Satan may tempt you because of your lack of self-control. He says, if you want to break this command, if you want to break this principle in the scriptures, then Satan will get into your marriage period the end. And maybe Satan's already gotten into your marriage. Maybe the touch has faded and the kiss has kiss leave and the sexual relationship dwindles and I can tell you I, I see it all the time that's why in counseling I always ask how's your guys' intimacy how's your spiritual intimacy how's your solical intimacy how's your physical intimacy are you cultivating all three because 
If not, you're missing out on a wonderful gift and an act of worship before the Lord because when you serve together and you read the scriptures together and you pray together, there is a spiritual intimacy that is taking part. When you do things together, when you enjoy things together, when you find out what the other one likes and you pursue that mentally, intellectually, emotionally, all your soul coming together in one, what happens is is God begins to bless it. Satan can't get in there either. And then when you come together in this supernatural act, this oneness in the sexual union, and you're loving one another and you're keeping pornography out and you're keeping uh, 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 pride out and you're keeping bitterness out and you're keeping resentment out and you're keeping shame out and you're keeping uh, uh, self-pity out and you're keeping all those things out of that relationship. When you come together in that, then what happens is it's something extremely beautiful and, and supernatural that can be an act of worship. Do you realize that sexual intimacy with your wife can actually be an act of worship just like when we were singing the song to God? Because it's a gift from God. He has given it to you as husband and wife as a gift to enjoy in the context of marriage. The Bible says the marriage bed is undefiled and honorable among all. And finally, guys, this flows out of one intimacy, the greatest intimacy from the God of heaven who said in the beginning, who said, let us go down and make man in our image. Let us create woman out of his side to become one with each other out of that intimacy. Now I am going to die on a cross and I am going to show you the ultimate sacrifice and the ultimate beautiful picture of intimacy that anybody has ever shown. I am going to die for the sins of the world and the wrath of God is going to be poured out upon me on that cross because I want to cultivate a church And I want that church to be intimate with me. I want that church to enjoy me because I am a gift, Jesus is saying to us. And I want your intimacy to be more radical and more amazing than any other intimacy in the planet. As you draw close to me, I will draw close to you. And out of that supernatural intimacy with God the Father through his son, Jesus Christ, what happens is, is now we are able to be intimate with one another. Guys, that's the beauty of it all. And just as your wife desires this intimacy, or your husband, the Lord desires this intimacy with you, this closeness, this becoming one. And you can get as close to Jesus as you want. The only thing holding you back from supernaturally experiencing Jesus Christ in a powerful, supernatural, incredible, amazing way why everything that you do is life and life abundantly is you or me. So my prayer is, as we close, as the worship team comes forward, again, if you've suffered the ripping of flesh and divorce, there is grace and mercy and love and forgiveness. Do yourself a favor, confess it to your children so that they don't make the same mistake. If you feel like your intimacy with the Christ is, is, is wavering and, 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 and not as is, is intimate and, and radical as it could be, then while we worship right now, as we prefer, prepare our hearts for communion, I encourage you to do business with God. Confess your sins to him. Ask him to forgive you and to bless you. It's okay to ask God to bless you. <laughs> Tell him you want this intimacy with him like you've never experienced it. And then when we take com- communion together and we remember him, we will be blessed. Amen? So will you stand with me? And let's pray. Father, thank you for these beautiful people. Thank you that you, Father, sent your only begotten son to die for me so that I could have a relationship with you in deep, abiding spirituality that you, you, solically, Lord, with my mind and my will and my emotions, all my intellect just engaging with you, God. And physically, Lord, as I give my heart to you and I, I cry out with my voice, Lord, would you, would you hear my praises? Would you become one with your church, Lord? Would you become one with me, God? 
The Father is in you, Jesus, just as you are in us. We are one. Take away anything in our lives that keeps us from that oneness. And Lord, I pray that you would heal marriages, God. And God, I pray that you would heal those that have been hurt and devastated and broken and beaten down by their marriages, Lord. I pray that you would heal those. And those that have been divorced, Lord, I, heal that you, I pray that you would heal their broken hearts. And bless them, Lord, as they move forward with you. And maybe even move forward with, their, with, with, with another uh, uh, wife or, or husband, God. Would you bless those marriages? In Jesus' name, amen.